Hello and welcome to this session on building web apps powered by Angular 2 using Visual Studio 2017. It's a snappy little title, just rolls off the tongue. My name's Darren May, I'm president and co-founder of Crank211. We're a digital agency that likes to produce next generation uh, experiences. We do a lot of work with Windows UWP, web applications, and cross-platform mobile. I myself am a Microsoft MVP for Windows development, and I've got a bunch of interests around biking, hiking, and I couldn't get the last one to rhyme, working out. What we're gonna be talking about today is how we can actually leverage Angular as part of a ASP.NET MVC core web application and bring these things together. So we're gonna talk about how we would get started with this, some essential tools, and how we're gonna go about creating an app. We're then gonna talk about how we can take that template and strip it down so we're starting fresh for our own particular application. We're then gonna go through some scenarios where we're taking an HTML mock and how we're gonna bring that into Angular. We're then gonna incorporate some data services into this mock that we've built. And finally, we're going to deploy this to Azure. Once we've done that, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to wrap things up. Okay, let's leap in. So, obviously we're talking about Visual Studio 2017 here, so it's, a, it's an essential tool for actually building this type of application. You'll wanna make sure you've installed the web payload for, or workload for the ASP.NET web development. There's also a reliance upon Node.js version six or later. Now typically when you're in Visual Studio, you would go to File, New, Create Project and you'd select a template in which you would create your project. The versions of the tools that we're using right now with the SPA templates actually come command line only, though I'm sure they'll be integrated into the new project dialog at some point in the future. Why are we gonna use the SPA template? Well, it brings a number of benefits. First and foremost, it solves a number of the challenges of bringing together the Angular client-side system with the ASP.NET Core server-side system so that we can actually have them hosted within a single solution. It really resolves some of the routing issues that happen with both of them trying to take control of things. It also incorporates a great capability called server-side pre-rendering. The advantage of this is that it leverages Node on the server to create a version of your page that can be downloaded very quickly when you start the application before the JavaScript client side has spooled up. And so it gives you a much faster application launch capability. We're also leveraging the Webpack dev middleware. The great thing about this Webpack tool is it runs in the background and is constantly monitoring your source files and will transpile your TypeScript as created and saved. That means it's always ready to go. That ties in very nicely with hot model replacing. This allows us to automatically refresh our browser to display new content as we're doing this. This means that we um, don't have to constantly compile our application, hit control F5 or F5 to launch it up and run it. It's actually running all the time. Obviously we'll need to compile if we're gonna create um, server side code, but this is great for rapid development of our client side application. The template also supports two build modes. One, which is dev-oriented, which makes sure that we have source maps that map our TypeScript source to our compiled JavaScript so that we can actually do debugging and integrate tightly with Chrome or Edge or Internet Explorer for debugging experiences. And we also have a production mode which leverages minification and also doesn't produce source maps to keep our de uh, deploy code as small as possible to really make it efficient for downloading. You can learn a lot more about the uh, SPA template itself from a great post by Steve Sanderson, and I've included a short link here to uh, allow you to go out to that site. So let's talk through installing the SPA templates. First and foremost, you'll need to verify that you have a version of Node installed on your system that's greater than version six. As you can see, I've got 7.5 installed on mine. You're then going to leverage the .NET command line tool and we're going to install those templates. So .NET new, we're gonna do dash dash install, and we're gonna specify Microsoft.ASP.NET core dot spa templates colon colon star. That means grab the latest version of these things. This is actually a fairly lengthy process. There's a lot of packages that will be downloaded, so I'm not gonna demonstrate that live for you. However, what I will demonstrate is actually creating an application using those templates. So let me switch over and show my command line. So I'm in command line, I'm in my demos folder. So your routine for creating these things 
is going to be, uh, you want first and foremost want to make a directory for yourself. So this is going to be my new application directory. I'm going to change directly into crankbank. And then I'm going to use the .NET command. And I can say new, and I can specify dash L. This will list all of the templates that are available for me. As we can see here, here's a list of these templates. And right here is our Angular template. You'll notice Aurelia, knockout.js, react.js, react.js, and Redux are also part of these SPAR application templates that are available for us. But as I mentioned, we're focusing on uh, Angular right now. So let me create my Angular application. And this rapidly expands out the template and creates my project. And as we can see, we've got a lot of source files here, including a CS proj file. We're going to leverage that in a moment. What we've done at this point is created our project, but we haven't actually downloaded any dependencies. Now, I could open this directly in Visual Studio right now, and Visual Studio will pull down NuGet packages and would also pull down the NPM packages that are required, the node packages. However, I actually prefer doing this in the command line for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is that I can actually see the progress of the NPM installs, whereas it's a background task in Visual Studio, and you just get a little busy icon moving in the status bar. So let me do this. So .NET restore. And so this is a very quick operation. And then I'm going to say npm install. Now this is a longer operation as it's going to bring down all of the various npm packages that are documented within the packages JSON file that's part of our application environment. So I'm going to leave that running and come back to my slide deck. So what we've just briefly ran through is a couple of essential tools, such as Visual Studio 2017 and Node. We've discussed briefly how to install the SPAR template, and then we've demonstrated the creation of a SPAR template, and we're in the process of preparing it for uh, opening it in Visual Studio. What we're now going to look at is how we can take the application that's been created for us and remove some of the components that we don't necessarily need if we're building our own application. Effectively, what we have is we have an application that includes some sample components that show you how you can use some of the capabilities, such as uh, callback into your uh, TypeScript to increment counters, fetch data from a ASP.NET Web API service, and so on. We're going to remove those so that we're actually ready to go for um, building our own application. So let me switch back over and let's see if our uh, resources have completed. So yes, they have. So we've actually finished downloading our dependencies. So now I'm just going to start up uh, Visual Studio by launching our CS proj. So this will bring up Visual Studio. And obviously, it's opening up the solution. It will do a check for us to make sure that we've got our um, dependencies downloaded. So we should see that happen very quickly. And then the application itself will start up. If I hadn't pre-installed our NPM packages, we'd see something down in the uh, status bar. And the, uh, it would be a little sluggish. So I actually prefer to do it in the command line. So now I'm just going to hit Control F5 so we can quickly see the sample application that we have installed. So this is it spooling up. It's launching IIS uh, Express to host our site. And here's our quick sample application. You see we've got Crankbank here, which is the title of the application. But we have a bunch of components that we actually don't need to use. So let me switch back to Visual Studio, and I'm going to show how we delete some of these things. Before I jump into that, I just want to call out startup.cs. Inside Startup CS is some of the routing magic on the MVC side of the house that maps to our home controller so we can deliver our first view via MVC and also introduces a SPA fallback route so that everything else gets handed over nicely to our um, Angular application. If I jump into views very quickly, we can see views, home, so following the convention, there's the index.cshtml. This is the single page that will be served by our MVC application that will launch our SPA application. You'll notice we have an app element referenced here. This points to our app component in Angular. We are also launching our uh, compiled, transpiled, minified client.js to launch our application. But here is the magic tag that actually 
fires off the server-side pre-rendering of our um, application to speed application launch. Just going to jump quickly into controllers. Here's the home controller, and as you can see, it does virtually nothing other than turn around and say, if we've got a request for the home path, we're going to return the index document, which is the view which I just showed you, which is going to launch our application, and then we have a simple error action. We have a sample data controller that actually we're not going to leverage as part of our sample, so we're going to get rid of that. And now we're going to move over into the Angular world. That's hosted inside this client app folder. We have two TypeScript files here that are responsible for supporting our hot module loading and uh, actually starting up our application. We won't play around with those too much, but our application itself is inside our app folder. Here we have appmodule.ts. So this is the main configuration for our application module. It includes a number of imports that bring in the components that we're leveraging. We have our ng module decorator, which is a specific type of function new to Angular 2 that allows us to attach metadata to our app module. And as we can see, we actually have very nothing at all inside our app module. It's all being configured through this declarative data here. Here's our bootstrap. This tells us that we're going to be launching our app component as our startup component. This is a list of the components that we're going to reference inside our module. And down here, we've got some path configurations that have set up the Angular routing. As we're going to be removing some of these things, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to get rid of counter and fetch data. We're going to come up here. We're going to delete nav menu, counter, and fetch data here. And we're also going to remove the imports for those as we're going to delete them from our system. So we've deleted those extra components. We're referencing just the components we have. So now we can jump in and expand up our components folder. And we can see we have a counter directory. We're going to delete that component. We have a fetch data directory. We're going to delete that component. And we have nav menu. We're going to delete that component. Now we quickly need to modify our HTML just to remove any references to things. We have a router outlet. This is where any of our routed components are going to render their output. So we're going to take that one and we're going to move that up. And we're just going to drop that inside a Bootstrap container. It's interesting to note that Bootstrap is included as part of this template, which allows us to create good UI without necessarily having to have a designer involved. And you'll see that later on. If we look at the home, in this home component, we have a lot of extraneous data. So I'm just going to strip this down into Hello World, and we're just going to save our application. Now, we're being prompted here to create a solution file, and that's a necessary step if we're going to persist our solution. So we'll just save that. So now if we switch back to our home page, we see a number of errors related to how we've um, gone through and basically hacked out components that the system was expecting at this moment in time. If we refresh, we get some additional errors which are related to the fact that our application has been dramatically changed whilst we're running. So what I'm actually going to do is come back into my application in Visual Studio. I'm hitting Control F5 to relaunch my application. This should now start us up clean, and we should have a hello world showing. And of course, it wouldn't be a live demo if we didn't have a change. So I've just hit Control R to refresh my browser and remove the cache. And now we're actually getting our application running as expected. So we have Hello World showing, which is the output of our home component. And that is being displayed in the position of the router outlet inside this page. OK. So that's basically got us back to our clean point. So in summary, we've just demonstrated how we can quickly remove some components and get ready to actually create our application. So now we're going to look at how we can um, take an HTML mock and bring it into Angular. So the scenario that we're in is that we have a designer who's created a set of HTML files, and they've said, OK, go ahead and build this. We're going to review these HTML files, and we're going to componentize them. Then we're going to implement them in Angular. So I'll let you bask in the glory of this um, highly designed um, application. Yes, I admit I did it with Bootstrap. What we're basically showing here is a sample application that looks somewhat like a, a bank account. We have an initial view that is going to show us our account summary. 
and we have a detailed view that's going to show the activities. If I look at the account summary page, we can break this down into a number of components. We have a shared header component that we're going to use across both of our pages. We have an account summary list component that is going to hold a number of instances of the account summaries that are going to show a summary of each of the accounts, such as a checking account, saving account, and so on. If we also look at the account detail, we can see that this breaks down in a similar fashion. We have a shared header component. We have an account detail component. We're actually going to reuse our account summary component from elsewhere. And we're going to have an account activity component. Now, obviously, as part of this demo, I don't have time to create all of these things, so I'll be dropping in some code to get us to that point at some point in time. One thing other that I'm going to be using to help speed things along is a useful extension that's been published by Matt, Mads Christensen out on the Video Studio Marketplace. This is the Angular 2 Snippet Pack. This contains, as you can see, a very large number of different snippets. I'm going to be using ng2 component. I'll be using ng2 HTTP GET, uh, ng2 pipe, and some structural components, ngif and uh, ng4. It's a great productivity boost to install this. I'm also going to be trying to comply with the Angular style guide. This is documented out at this URL. Um, it provides guidance on naming your components and naming your files, and also on how you would lay out your source within your application itself. So without further ado, let's jump into creating some of these components. So one of the things that we mentioned was that we have this HTML mock site. So if I open this up, I can actually bring that HTML into my Visual Studio environment and have a look. And we can see that our designer, me, has marked up this source file so that I can easily see the HTML that relates to particular components. The first one we have on this list is header. So let's go ahead and create header. Now we're going to use a convention here, which is that each area we're actually going to create a folder to contain it. So I'm going to add a new folder, and I'm going to call this shared. Inside here, I'm going to create another folder, which is going to be for my header. If I could spell it correctly. Now inside here, I'm going to create two files. I'm going to create a new item, which is going to be an HTML file. And using a convention, I'm going to call this header.component and leave the HTML extension. I'm then going to add another file, and this is going to be a TypeScript. I press Control shift a to bring this up quickly. And this is going to follow a similar convention. It's going to be header, again, if I could spell it correctly, .component, .ts. OK, we've got default HTML in here, so we're going to delete that for the time being. And then we're going to go back into the header component. And this is where I'm going to use my first snippet. So ng2 component, tab tab. So I'm going to call this shared header. So this is the element that I'll refer to in my HTML when I uh, use this. We have an inline template here. Well, I've already created an external file, so we don't care about this for the time being. But now I'm going to name this class header component. One of the great things that we have in Visual Studio is we've imported our um, component decorator here. And so IntelliSense now knows the properties that are available to me. So I can press Control Space, and I can see that I have a, a template URL property that I can populate. So what I'm going to do now is specify the path to my header component.html. So what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm just going to put a uh, paragraph in here that says header. So we know that that's there. Now in order to leverage this component, I need to register it within my app module. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to create a new import statement. I'm going to leave this empty for the time being from slash. And now what we can see is we actually get paths that are prompted for us. The Visual Studio understands our layout here. And so we know we're in shared, we know we're in header, and we know inside there is our header component. If I now come back into here and I press Control Space again, it tells us these are the exported components that are available in that source, which is awesome. 
So now I've got my header component imported. I need to declare it so that it's available for use within my environment. I can drop this in. And now let's go ahead and change my app page. So inside my app component, this is where I have my router outlet that's going to show my routed elements, but I want my header to be shown all of the time. So I'm going to move that above here, and I'm going to create my shared header component. So I'm going to save that. If I switch over to here and refresh, hit Control F5 just to refresh my uh, environment. Quick as a flash. OK, what did I do wrong here? Let's have a look at shared header. Let's come back into my header component. My, I said shared element. Look at that. So there you go. This is, you can tell it's live. So I save this. I come back into my page. Refresh. And hurrah. So here we have our header appear. And here is our content, our home controller being displayed. So now what we want to do is actually get our um, JavaScript in. So I'm going to come into uh, my JavaScript, my HTML for my header. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to drop it into my header component. So I'm just going to replace this, save it, and we see that immediately this is at refreshed. I didn't hit Control R. I didn't have to hit Control F5 or anything along those lines. This is refreshed and is showing exactly what it is that we wish to uh, display. But we are missing some images. So this brings me to our WW root folder. This is the actual base of our delivered uh, web application. And so in here, this is where we would put assets associated with um, images and so on and so forth. So I'm going to create an assets folder here. And I'm going to go into my HTML mock. I also have a fav icon that I can drop in. That will replace the existing one. And I can also go into assets and grab my logo.svg. And I can paste that into assets here. So if I refresh my page, because this doesn't cause a transpilation to occur, we won't actually all pick it up automatically. So I refresh my page. We see we've got our logo. And we've got our home page here. So that's an example of how simply we can actually pull in some HTML and get our um, start to mock out our componentry and actually start to build out our application. What we would do right now is we would rinse and repeat this process for each one of the components that we have in place. So rather than you watch me do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag in some components that I prepared earlier. So I'm going to open this in File Explorer. And I've got my just HTML folder, which is, as I say, my prepared components. And I'm just going to grab these, and I'm going to drop these in. I'm going to replace those files in the destination. Now, what's interesting about this is our environment automatically refreshes. That all of a sudden, I now have additional folders for account summary, account list, account detail. I have an account folder. Inside here, I have all of the additional files that I just dropped in. So rather than having to do a add to project or anything along those lines, this is monitoring the directory structure and bringing them in. Something else I should call your attention to is how it's nicely nested our TS files beneath our HTML files. It's using a pattern matching there. And if I was to add a CSS file as well, you would see that that would nest nicely below the HTML. So we just dropped these things in. Let's refresh. And as you can see, this has already brought up our new componentry in. And we've actually updated our display. We're getting some of the interaction that we uh, expected with our uh, mouse over. But we're actually not able to navigate anywhere. So we very quickly started to flesh out these applications. And just to prove that there's no smoke and mirrors going on here, let's have a look at the account list component. And we can see all it is is just HTML that we've dropped in. And we don't have any magic going on behind the scenes in the TS file. So it's just some static data that we've dropped in. But what we would like to do is we've got our detail component, but we actually don't have a way to traverse to or navigate to our detail component at this moment in time. So what we're going to do is 
add this to our route system so that we can actually go and uh, display it. Our routing is defined in our appmodule.ts. So let me bring that up. So here are the existing routes that we had. One thing you'll note is we've replaced the home route with an account route so that we go to our account list because we actually no longer need our home component. But what I'm going to do now is add in an additional route and that's going to go to our account detail component. So we've got detail is going to be the name of the route, but we also know that at some point in the future we're going to want to pass in the account ID. So I'm going to make this a parameterized uh, route that I can pass in a, the ID of the route of the account that I wish to show. I've already imported the account detail up here and it's already declared. So now all I need to do is bring this component in and drop it in here. Now I can save this. And if I come up here and type in a route of detail slash one, two, three, four, five, because I need an ID. That should take us straight to our detail page, which it does. I've had a little bit of thinking there. So this is our detail page and I can hit back and we can see that the routing system is working well and able, moving us backwards and forwards between our two views. But obviously the intent is that we would actually be able to navigate based upon clicking on one of these items. So how are we going to go about doing that? Well, in order to do that, we actually need to um, integrate into our uh, summary and respond to a click event. So this is one of the first things I've talked about which require binding. So I'm going to actually bind to the click event handler in my summary and whenever I click on it I'm going to invoke a function on my TypeScript navigate to detail. If I open up my TypeScript if I create a function in here navigate to detail and just so we can prove that it's working, I'm going to say alert and I'm going to show detail here. I can save this. So if I come in here now and I click on it, up comes my alert that says detail. So we know the magic is working, we're subscribing to the event and so on. But actually I want to do something where I'm going to navigate. So in order to do that I need to tie into the routing system. So I need something like this dot router.navigate and I'm going to pass an array of parameters. I know my route is detail, that's what I just created in my module and I also know I'm supposed to pass in an ID so I'm going to put that in place. But the challenge is how do I get hold of the router? Well the great thing about Angular is it has a dependency injection system. The router component is actually a core part of uh, the system so that is already available and registered as part of dependency injection and in effect dependency injection says that an external container is going to be the responsible for the life cycle of the component that can be injected and it will look at components to see if they require an instance of that uh, external dependency when they're constructed. So I've kind of foreshadowed there that we can do this by turning around and adding a parameter to our constructor of type router and I've already included in here the uh, import for router and inside here I would then create a private mem uh, member variable called router of type router that's the type in TypeScript working for us and in here I would say this dot router is equal to the supplied router as part of the constructor. That's a lot of typing of course and the great guys at the uh, TypeScript group have worked out that why not shortcut all of this so we can just type private router up here and that will do the same thing as creating a uh, private router variable and we'll um, then make that available from the this dot. So let's save this. Let's jump into my home page. If I click on it now you can see I navigate to my account. Of course, we're still showing static data inside here, but at least we're able to navigate around and move between our components. So that brings me back to the presentation.
So what I've quickly shown there is how it's relatively straightforward to create a number of different components and to import HTML in from a, a series of mocks to, to very quickly flesh out the structure of your application. I've also shown how you can create a simple route that we can pass a parameter across, an ID, that we can use at some point in the future for pulling in uh, data. I've also shown um, output binding to enable us to respond to a click event on a div. And I've shown how we can route via code and how we can leverage dependency injection to bring that router in. What I'm going to talk about now is how we can start incorporating data into this rather than static HTML. So the objective of this particular section is we're going to create some data classes. We're going to remove the hard-coded data in the HTML. And then we're going to display some data using bindings and templates. So before I jump into the code itself, let's talk a little bit about binding. We've got a couple of different types of binding that are available to us. The first is interpolation. And effectively, interpolation evaluates expressions. And you can tell in interpolation because it has these double curly braces surrounding some form of expression. For the first one here, for example, we have account.name. So the outcome of this expression would be the values held in account.name, which in this scenario is Darren. The second one shows that we can actually evaluate any JavaScript style expression. So 4 plus 4 would evaluate to 8, and that's what would be displayed there. We have another capability in here which allows us to put a null guard in place. So for example, if a count was a undefined, trying to access the name property of an undefined object would create an error for us, and that would break our templating and break our rendering. So we can put this guard in place to prevent trying to evaluate that expression if the account is null. There's actually other ways of doing this using structural ngif and so on and so forth to prevent us from even trying to evaluate expressions, and I'll show that in a while. Input binding. So we're using square braces here, and this indicates that the value of the account property is going to be input into the property on the associated element, and we'll be demonstrating that shortly. We've already seen an example of output binding where uh, we subscribe to the click event, and that causes our navigate to details function to be invoked. There's another type of binding, two-way binding, that we actually won't be demonstrating as part of this, but it's well known because of its, uh, the mnemonic that people use to remember which order the braces go. It's the banana in the box binding, where you have the square brace with a, a parentheses inside it, which is essentially the banana in the box. And that illustrates that we both input and output binding on a property. So without further ado, let's leap into starting to add data into our application. So we're back in Visual Studio. So before we can actually start showing data, we have to have some way of have creating data and storing data. So I'm going to go into my shared folder, and I'm going to create a data type. So this is going to be a new TypeScript file. And we're going to create account summary.type. So again, we're following a naming convention here, using dashes to uh, split the words of the class name, and we're specifying the type of the file, which happens to be type in this instance, as part of this. So now we have our account summary. So let's open that up. We're going to create a class that's going to be available elsewhere, so we're going to export it. It's account summary, and we're going to have a number of properties on here. We're going to have account number, which is typed as a string. We're going to have type which is going to be an enumeration type, which we haven't created yet. So we'll put that in place, and we'll come back to that. We're then going to create the name of the account, which is going to be a string. And then we're going to have the balance of the account, which is going to be a number. That will make sense. So let's quickly create the um, enumeration. So we're going to add a new TypeScript file. This is going to be account type dot enum, dot ts, make sure we've got that. So again, we're, we're describing what our type is here. We're going to export the enum. It's going to be an enum account type. We are then going to add in here the types of accounts. So we've got checking, we've got 
savings, and then we have credit. So if I come back into my account summary, I wish I had a dollar for every time I double clicked on something and ended up trying to move it in, my, in Visual Studio. Import, we're going to import our account type, and then we're going to bring it in from the account summary type. Oh, I put that in the wrong place. Let's put that into our account summary. There we go. I know there's many of you shouting, it's in the wrong place out there. Fortunately, I heard you apparently. Okay, so we've brought in account, <laughs> and I've brought in the wrong type, so now it needs to be type.enum. That's the wonderful thing about IntelliSense and these squigglies and so on, it tells you when you're going wrong, so it makes it much easier. Okay, so we've got our account type, and we've got our account summary, now we want to leverage that data. So let's go back into our accounts uh, list component. And this is where we're going to, if we look at the HTML, we have a list of cash accounts and we've hard coded um, that we're gonna show two of our account summaries. And down here we've hard coded that we're showing one of those. But that doesn't make any sense. So we wanna work out some way of having the, uh, the system actually generate these based upon what we need. So we want something like and I'm going to use another slip, snippet here, ng2. We're going to use the ng4 structural con, uh, construct, which says we can loop through every account that's in, say, cash accounts, and it's going to repeat this element for every instance it discovers within the cash accounts. And the same thing down here, that we're going to do this inside the credit accounts. But wait a minute, you say, we don't have any credit accounts right now. You're absolutely right, so let's create those. So we're coming to account list, and we're gonna import, we know we need account summary, because that's our data type, and if I spell it correctly, it'll be even more successful. And we're gonna bring that in from our shared account summary type. We're also going to need our type because we're going to want to differentiate between the types of the accounts. And so we're going to bring in our enumeration. Okay, so now let's create some member variables. So what do we call these? Cash accounts. And that's going to be a type account summary array. And we're going to have credit accounts. And that's also going to be an account summary array. So if we view our page right now, we can see that this is empty. Makes sense, we haven't put anything inside our array. So all of this stuff is starting to hang together. But obviously that's not an ideal display. So maybe what we can do is we can do use ngif to show something in case this occurs. So maybe I'm going to put a paragraph in here that says no cash accounts. And I'm going to control whether that's displayed based upon another structural directive, which is ngif. So I use a snippet. It really doesn't save me that much. But what I'm saying is if we have cash accounts as undefined, we're going to display that. And I'm going to copy this down here, and I'm going to drop this in here. And I'm going to say if credit accounts are not defined, we're going to say no credit accounts. OK, so we've got those set up. Let's have, come back in here. And we can see that the magic is just working, that uh, because those are undefined, we're displaying these things. OK, well, let's get some test data to actually inject in there. So I'm going to create this in the constructor. I point this out because this is actually a bad idea. Creating content in the constructor means that any time your um, component is being created, it's going to be injected into your um, component. If you're running unit tests, you're having this static data created. There's actually lifecycle events on an it that will leverage once we're actually doing this more properly. But for the time being, let's quickly create this. So we're going to cache account, 
equals, I'm going to create a new array, and we're going to create a new object. Now, the great thing about all of this is that we have IntelliSense. It understands, because I've declared what cache account is, it's, and this should be this dot cache account, that's what the squiggly is telling me. Because I've declared that cache account is an array, or cache accounts, goodness, is an array of account summaries, it knows that the objects it's expecting should be a account summary. So I immediately get IntelliSense to allow me to create the correct shape of object. And that's the wonderful thing about the type system within TypeScript. So the account number, let's call this one, two, three, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven. And we're gonna have a balance, and we're gonna give it a balance of one, two, three, four, point five, six. We're gonna give it a name of, let's just call this checking. And we're gonna give this a type of account type dot checking. So we copy this and let's do it different numbers here. Two, three, four, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, and we'll make this one 5,234. This is going to be savings. And we're going to have this as a savings type. And we're just going to quickly rinse and repeat, delete one of these things. This is going to be credit accounts. And let's put a credit card style number in here, so 111-222-333-444. And we'll call this credit. And we're going to say this is type credit. If I can spell that correctly. OK. So we've got that. Now if we flick back over to here, bang. All of a sudden we now have these instances displayed. But they're actually not showing the right data because we're not passing it into our summary component at all. So let's quickly look at how we can approach this. If we come back into our account HTML, we've got an account summary here, and we've got this account variable that's being set, but we're actually not consuming it anywhere. So let's assume that we're going to have an input on our account summary that's going to take that account value. And we have the same down here. So now what we've got is we're passing in a parameter, but this is causing a problem because we actually don't have a property on account summary that accepts this. So let's jump to account summary and rectify that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the input. And every time I type in out, we type input, and we're going to create a property on here that's going to be decorated with the at input decorator. And this is the account summary property. And that is going to be of type account summary. So we know we're going to need to import that. So let's import account summary. And we're importing that in from our shared summary type. So now we know we've got the count summary. And if we come into our HTML, all of this is saved. So we can see that we're still showing rubbish, basically. So let's change this now. So now we're going to start showing uh, this is going to be our name. So let's use our interpolation binding. And we're going to show account summary dot name. Save that. Look at our home page. Hit refresh there, it was a little bit slow in picking up. So we can now see that checking, savings, and credit are being displayed. So we can jump down to here and show account summary dot account number. Save that, and here we can drop in a 
count summary dot balance. Okay, so now we can see we're actually getting live data shown in here. Now hold on just a second. We're showing all of the digits of our account number and in our demo app, <laughs> in our demo app, he says, repeating himself, we um, are showing just the last four digits. Let's bring that back up again. So we're just showing the last four digits. And uh, we're also showing a currency formatted uh, output for our balance, whereas in our application itself, we're just showing the raw numbers. So let's show quickly how we can go about doing this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to quickly add in uh, a formatter. So if we look at our balance, we're going to use a built-in pipe. And the purpose of a pipe is to transform output into a new format. And we actually have a built-in currency type that takes the parameters and it uses a colon to separate it. And we're going to say we're going to use US dollars here. We're going to say true, we want to show the symbol, not the um, string. And we're going to supply a format, which is we're going to show a minimum of one integer element. We're going to show a minimum of two uh, fractional components. And we're going to show a maximum of two fractional components. So if I do a quick save on here, what we can then see is we've got updated and we're now showing our currency. We have a, um, the desire to actually reformat our account number here. So we actually want to have a pipe that would take this and actually strip out the last two. So I'm going to show you very quickly how we can create a custom pipe component. So again, another dollar. I'm going to add a new item, TypeScript file. And in this TypeScript file, it's going to be We're going to call this um, format dash account number dot pipe. And we're going to use another of our snippets. Again, another dollar. ng2, I want to use pipe. So we're creating our pipe, and our pipe is going to be short name format format account number, and we're going to, a class name is going to be format, format account number. We know we're actually going to pass in a type of string to our transform method. We don't need to pass in any additional parameters, and we're going to return a type of string. So we're going to quickly put a quick guard in here that says if the value is undefined, we're just going to return an empty string. And then we're going to return ellipsis plus, and then we're going to have a ternary expression that says if the value dot length is greater than 4, then we're going to return the value dot substring value dot length minus four. Otherwise, we're just going to return the value because it's less than four characters long anyway. So we're going to drop that in. Now we need to make sure that we go and import and declare it inside our module. Goodness gracious me, just hit enter. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to import that pipe. And we're going to um, make it available. So the pipe is located out in the shared location. So it's in components, shared, format account number pipe. We have that there. And we're going to import our account number pipe. We're going to declare it, make it available. And then we're going to remember that our name is 
format account number pipe. So we come back up into our summary component, and then we're going to add this onto our account number. And we've now truncated our account. So this has shown how we can do binding, but what we haven't done as yet is we haven't brought in any data from the server side. So let me show you how, that we, how we can do that. So rather than write a whole bunch of code here, I have prepared our data scenario. And so what I'm going to do is come back into our app, and I'm going to drop in components and app modules. And I'm going to paste these in and replace those files. And so what we've done here is we've actually integrated a bunch of components that are going to interact with our service. We've created a uh, web ser a service component that we're leveraging inside our uh, TypeScript inside our Angular application that is going to use HTTP to pull down our response and map it, map the JSON as that and cast it as an account summary array so we can inject it back into our components. We've also got the ability to get details, which we'll cover in a little while. In order to achieve that, we've had to create an the ability to inject our account service. So what we've done is we've added a providers element to our ng model decorator. And on our app module now understands that account service is available for injection. That is being leveraged inside our account list component using the same uh, constructor injection that we talked about beforehand. So now what we have is we're going to call on our account service, get account summaries. We're going to get those accounts, and we're going to filter based upon the type and load them into our cache accounts. And that's going to bring those things in. But what we're missing is a web API that's going to satisfy this requirement. So if we come over to our controllers, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new controller. And I'm going to search for the web API controller. And we're going to add this as a bank controller. I don't need any of these existing routes in here. But what we've got here is this is basically saying that if we access a route of API slash bank, then this controller is going to be um, addressed. What we're now going to do is add in our server snippets. So we're going to bring in some types. So these types actually align with the types that we have on our Angular client side. So we've got account summary, as you can see, that's very familiar. Account transaction, that shows on the detail. Account detail. And we also have the account type enumeration. We also are going to have the get account summary method. So we're not actually going to connect to a database here. We're going to have some static data declared in our service. But again, this looks very similar to what we had in our um, account list component. And so this get account summary is returning an object result of account summary. The reason we're returning object result is it also allows us to return things such as not found if we run into a situation where we request IDs of a component that's not already available to us. We will also bring in the get account detail method. So this one is a little bit more complicated. It just creates a, some random transactions that we can display. So because we've now changed the server side, we actually do need to compile and build this particular application. So that's sitting there up and running. Hit Control F5 and bring it up and run. So now we're starting up that application. And now we can see we're actually returning values from the server. We've got the server affix that we put on there. That's the data that's coming from the server. We can click into here, and we're now getting our list of transactions that have been randomly generated. So that's showing how we can integrate our data backwards and forwards. I just want to dive quickly into the, um, the service to talk a little bit about promises and um, observables. So inside our account service, what we have is we've got this HTTP get, which we're getting injected into us from the Angular environment. This is our API path to get the account summaries, and you've seen how that maps into our controller. 
This map, as I say, takes the response and projects it as a type account summary. We're bringing that in, and then basically we are leveraging the to promise operation to convert our observable to a promise. I just have a practice where I prefer to have a, um, a, a service leveraging observables and return promises back to my UI components. We're importing uh, reactive extensions here right now, and that's what allows us to do this map backwards and forwards. So that, in a nutshell, is how we actually integrate the data into our application. What I would like to show is how we can very quickly deploy this out to Azure. So if I jump through to my Azure deploy. So we've got a number of different options available to us to deploy our um, application out to Azure. We can use continuous integration and CI builds, and those can be uh, supported through visualstudio.com. If you have your project on there, you can attach it to monitor a GitHub repository or any sort of Git repository, to be honest, even the one on Visual Studio. And it will detect changes and automatically push those out. You can also actually configure local Git deploy, that you could add your Azure site as a remote on your local Git, and you could do a push to that, and that would deploy it. Or you can do a direct publish from Visual Studio. That's what I'm going to demonstrate right now. So I'm in my solution. If I right click on my Crankbank bank project, I have this publish option. If I select publish, it's going to bring me up this UI. It's going to say, do I want to do IIS FTP, folder, and so on? Well, I'm actually going to deploy through a Microsoft Azure app service. I'm going to select that, and I'm going to hit Publish. I've got Create New selected. So this is going to reach out and look at my subscription. And it's also going to generate for me an app name. Now, I'm going to just run with this because um, this is basically perfectly fine for this scenario. But it's pulled down my subscription. And it's also pulled down a number of default resource groups and so on. I do have the option of creating new resource groups if I want, and also a new service plan. So I could select free if I wanted to do a free service plan or whatever. But I've already prepared one, so I'm going to go into uh, West Central Plan as an example. This is going to create my deploy profile. So it's pulling down all the various data, the various keys necessary to be able to transfer this across to Azure. Always seems to run quicker when you're not live. And now we've created our published profile. And it's actually in the process now of creating a build. And this is going to use, if you recall before, talking about Webpack, where we have a production deploy. This is running through the production deploy scenario. So it's going to push out an app that's representative of our production environment. So now it's publishes started. We can see it's actually running through on the output here. Um, the packages that is pulled down. It should be doing a build. It should be reaching out and starting to upload to Azure. And we'll start to see some of that activity shortly. Whilst it's doing that, let me quickly re go and recap. As a whole, we've covered an awful lot of ground in this particular session. We showed how we could get started with some essential tools. We showed how you could refresh uh, the template and actually start with a pretty clean environment. We've shown how you can take HTML mocks and bring them across into Angular. And we've shown how you can incorporate data services. And of course, here we go. My publisher's just succeeded, and it's actually bringing up the application in Azure. Obviously, knew I wanted to show that over and above my um, presentation. Quick as a flash, obviously the initial startup is always the longest. And here we are. Here's our app out running on Azure. The navigation, the data generation, everything's working Azure side. So it's as simple as that to deploy to Azure. Deploy to Azure, as we've just demonstrated. And obviously we're wrapping up right now. So I hope this gave you some insight into the value and power that the uh, Angular Spa template brings to developing applications and how it's very, very easy to create an Angular application that's hosted within an ASP.NET MVC core application and how you can easily le uh, leverage ASP.Core web APIs as part of your Angular application. I hope this was useful to you. 
Have a good day.